everyone. So my name is Tony Jia. I'm a uh, researcher at the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Institute of Technology, LC for short. And I'm also a, an affiliated researcher with Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. I'd like to thank Mike for such a great musical introduction. Um, and then I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to share my research. Thank all the audience for staying awake for this and the next talk. There's two more great talks, so keep it up. And then um, I'd really like to thank all of my abundant YouTube and Facebook fans following online, if there are any. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so yeah, so today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about some research I've been doing at LC re regarding polyester micro droplets and their role as compartments. Uh, similar to Amit, this actually was published yesterday, so please read this online also afterwards if you have any interest. Um, so I'm going to make a very big generalization here. So biology is very complicated. And biology is made of cells, and cells are very complicated. Cells have a ton of different functions and very specific organelles which have been tailored to perform very specific functions. So many modern biologists and biochemists are really interested to study how exactly the cell functions and how exactly it formed. Uh, I'm going to, again, make a very gross oversimplification here. and uh, Assume this is a modern cell. All right, it's not this simple, but basically you have uh, DNA genetic material that turns into RNA, and RNA makes proteins, which are, um, you have enzymes, you have very functional catalytic molecules, and these are all enclosed within a uh, lipid bilayer. This is like the compartment that encloses all of these things. What did an early cell look like? So. Well, we don't really know exactly how modern proteins could have uh, evolved and assembled. We don't really understand how DNA came about. And so many people do believe that primitive cells are some type of uh, lipid vesicle layer with RNA inside. Uh, I'm going to skip the next part because Krishna did a really good job to explain the RNA world hypothesis. And basically what, what we, we understand is because RNA was genetic information and could perform catalytic functions, it's been proposed to be one of the first early biomolecules on the early Earth. Now, furthermore, though, one, one question that many researchers have had is, uh, you know, how exactly did RNA replicate? Uh, there's been a lot of research progress, oh no, in this field, we still don't have a really concrete answer, and we don't necessarily have a very concrete answer about how this lipid vesicle type bilayer vesicle form, and we don't even really have a con concrete answer of how exactly RNA could have formed. So, you know, what on earth happened? Um, whether you, you know, understand the RNA world to be correct or not, we still need to understand, you know, even if it were correct, what about before such a world existed? What happened on earth before vesicles? What happened before RNA? And so these are really interesting questions that I've been very um, I've been working towards at LC. One of the important uh, top things that you should understand is there are many ways by which biomolecules could have uh, formed and assembled on Earth. As we've seen with many of these talks, they could have come from extraterrestrial sources, could have been synthesized from spark discharge or through um, catalysis by mineral surfaces. And so there's a many ways by which you know nucleotides or amino acids or lipids could have could have been formed on the early earth and one of the things that's very important to understand is that when you're forming these biomolecules you're also at the same time forming many non biomolecules there's many biomole many mo molecules forming at the same time as these relevant biomolecules through all of these processes and so what i wanted to know was can non biomolecules catalyze life's emergence in some way? Can we take all of these you know, extra things that also existed on early Earth, and can that assemble into something interesting and important for the emergence of initial life? Um, I think Amy, in her talk, talk, spoke briefly about alpha hydroxy acids. Basically, structurally, they're very similar to amino acids. Um, their difference is one functional group. And what's interesting about hydroxy acids is even though they don't participate in, if, if you 
understand modern biology to be DNA, RNA to proteins, they don't participate in that type of process, which is so-called central dogma. But they are very prebiotically abundant, and they also are compatible with modern biology. So you can actually replace amino acids in the translation system that forms proteins, and you can replace them with alpha hydroxy acids, and what you get is, in the end, polymers of alpha hydroxy acids called polyesters. So we know that these alpha hydroxy acids, these monomers, are very common prebiotically, and they're um, compatible with modern life, and so what we wanted to do was uh, we wanted to take many different types of alpha hydroxy acids. Uh, don't worry about the details so much, but understand that we uh, took a, many different chemical functionalities and, or we took many different alpha hydroxy acids with different chemical functionalities. And in a c complex mixture, we wanted to utilize wet drying cycles to form polymers. So monomers are one circle, polymers are many circles kind of uh, shoved together, and we wanted to form polymers and see if these polymers could have assembled into something useful for life's emergence. So these are the five that we tested, and we first took mixtures, uh, solutions of each of these, their concentrated solutions, in water, and we dried them down. Drying is a reasonable, primitive process. We dried them down, and we wanted to analyze the product. So. We did that by taking the products and subjecting that to something called MALDI MS, so Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionic Mass Spectrometry. Basically, we took a solid and we analyzed the components of that chemically through measuring the masses of whatever was in there. And you read this by the x-axis is the mass of a given molecule and the y-axis is the abundance. And what you end up seeing is that, for example, here, this peak represents one molecule, which is mass, you know, like 560. This peak represents a molecule of mass, you know, 600 something. And what we saw was that after this polymerization process, we didn't just make one product, we made a variety of products. It's polydispersed products. They ranged in um, size from, you know, a few units long up to the 40s. And each peak was, the difference between each peak was the correct mass for each um, monomer unit. And so that's how we knew that each one corresponded to a specific um, polymer length. So yeah, we were able to create up to, you know, in this case for lactic acid, up to 44 um, uh, units long polyesters. And we did this for all five of these combinations. And in each case, you, do, you produce not just one compound, you produce a polydispersed mixture of compounds. And the maximum length of each uh, differed between 15 and 40, depending on each of the monomers that you used. What we did see, actually, was after drying, this is about after a week, uh, we saw, we found this you know, gel-like substance. Um, and we saw this for almost all of the samples we tested. So for four out of the five HOMO polymer samples, that is the samples with one type of alpha hydroxy acid in the starting mixture, these all formed the gel-like substance. And also, when we mixed all five of them together and subjected it to the drying process, they also formed the gel-like structure. Uh, in one case, polyglycolate, so polyglycolic acid, did not form this gel-like structure. Uh, there's a mechanistic study that I won't uh, get into right now. Um, so then you, you form this gel structure, so what, right? So what? Um, the next thing we did was we actually rehydrated these gel-like structures. It's been shown that with this alpha hydroxy acid polyester system, you can do repeated rehydration and drying cycles, and you actually get different sequences each time. Um, that assumes that the sample isn't dried to completion. In this case, it was actually dried to completion, we believe, which formed this gel-like structure. And upon rehydration, it assembled into these microdroplets. Each homo polyester formed microdroplets, except the one that didn't form the gel. And the mixture also formed the microdroplets. Interestingly, 
all mixtures of two, three, four, or five, all combinations of those, all formed micro droplets. And we believe that um, it, you can probably add in some other chemical functionalities and it would still form similar types of droplets. And so what you, what you should get from this is just that we can form polyester gels from drying of alpha hydroxy acids and they can assemble into micro droplets in aqueous media. We're also interested to see some of the dynamics of these droplets. So one of the important things that we're in, we're, we, we think is important for early life is the preservation of individuality. How, how long do, can separate droplets stay before they merge together? And so this is just a video at their ambient conditions. And you can see that maybe it's a bit grainy, but the droplets don't easily, don't quickly coalesce. Um, on the order of minutes to hours. It takes about a day or so for them to coalesce into kind of a large macroscopic droplet. But when we added salt, we actually saw that the droplets started to coalesce much more quickly and they actually stuck to the glass surface in the microscope. We believe that this is because the salt, and some researchers have done um, simulations on this, that we believe that the salt is locating to the outside of the droplets, it's lowering the surface tension of the droplets, and that's causing them to kind of merge together a bit more and uh, stick to the glass surface quickly. And uh, further studies are ongoing into determining exactly this mechanism, including measuring directly where these salts ended up. Um, and then there's some also implications of these droplets as compartments. As you know, Cells contain many things in them, modern cells, genetic material, enzymes, nutrients, primitive cells, protocells also necessarily had to contain some type of um, catalytic or informational polymer in them. And so these droplets, we first, we wanted to test whether they could encapsulate things. And we, the easy thing to do was we found some fluorescent dyes and we saw that these fluorescent dyes were able to segregate into the droplets. The dyes are fairly hydrophobic, and we believe that the interior of the droplets is also very hydrophobic, owing to the very long polyesters that produce them. But also, we are able to see that fluorescently labeled RNA is able to go into one of the droplet types, which suggests that perhaps one of these droplet types, or some droplet type that we haven't probed in this study, could have been able to um, compartmentalize and seg segregate primitive genetic materials. And so this also has implications that the uh, initial chemical components of these alpha hydroxy acids that we use to make the droplets will determine their phenotypic function, if you will, because only one of them could segregate these fluorescent RNA. And just a, a few more examples of the interaction between the droplets and biomolecules. We, we took some um, superfolded GFP that was expressed um, by a collaborator at ELSI. Um, he's uh, in Sean McGlynn's lab. That name's been floating around a few times. And uh, he provided us some superfolded GFP. This actually functioned in the droplets, suggesting that even within this confined space, the um, function and the structure of these, this protein could still be preserved. And we were able to see that certain fluorescent lipid could assemble layer around one of the droplets. We're not sure whether it's a single layer or a bilayer or multi-layer. Maybe it's a multi-layer, but uh, we can see that this fluorescent lipid does have some propensity to assemble around this droplet, suggesting that maybe the droplets, we, whether or not they were direct precursors to modern cells or primitive cells or not, and possibly they weren't, they could have still catalyzed the assembly of some structures that could have been prebiotically important for the initial emergence of life. And so with that said, I'd like to just go over this really quickly. We started with a monomer solution we dried by heat to form polymers, uh, polyesters. Upon rehydration, they form microdroplets, and these microdroplets are able to compartmentalize certain dyes and biomolecules. And so what I hope that you got from this study is that um, non-vesicle compartments are also important for origin of life studies, and that even non-biological molecules could have 
had a hand in producing important biological structures or materials or molecules that could have uh, helped in the initial emergence of life. So I'd like to thank all of my funding, uh, all of my collaborators, especially those in bold who directly contributed to this study. Um, and uh, I'm from LC, we're an interdisciplinary institute in Tokyo that's uh, interested in studying the origin and evolution of planets, Earth, and life on Earth. And so if you have any opportunity, please, I uh, hope you can visit. We have an annual symposium every year. Next year's will be in February. So I hope that you can, if you're able to, please join us. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions for Tony? Uh, so wh why do you think you got that uh, Gaussian distribution? It was like bell-like. Uh, okay, so you're referring to... When you got... Yeah, yeah. okay, this one. Yeah, so uh, if you assume that the um, condensation of an additional monomer piece is somewhat um, stochastic, then perhaps you get some type of distribution where there is like a, a, media, a, a mean and there are fewer molecules that are larger and fewer molecules that are smaller. And this is also uh, helped by the fact that this uh, conjugation reaction is not um, one direction, it's bi-directional. And so you do get, uh, once you form the polyesters, once you form the polymers, you do have some backwards uh, reaction as well. So, okay. thank you, Tony. I had a couple questions. Um, so, uh, this was just one drying. It wasn't wet dry cycling. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, can you speak about what you think would happen if you were cycling a little bit? Yeah. So, I think the cycling question is heavily uh, de determined by whether the initial reactants have completely dried or not. If you're still in a mostly liquid state then by rehydrating, you're shifting the equilibrium of the reaction from formation of polymers back into monomers. And this is because the formation of the polymers requires loss of water. But if you're in this gel soft state, kind of not quite liquid, not quite solid state, maybe there is some hydrolysis. And it, I think it depends on the um, chemistries that you've used specifically, but also perhaps the fact that you're forming these um, kind of aggregated structures, the surface area that water can attack, if you will, is maybe limited by formation of these structures. So we haven't done any of these studies yet, but we're interested to study whether actually assembly can prevent um, their own degradation and also if they can prevent the degradation of things that have been compartmentalized within the droplets. And then uh, I also just wanted, to, maybe I missed it, but um, what was the scale bar for those images? What are the sizes of those uh, yeah, micro droplets? So, good question. Sorry, I actually completely skipped that. So these images are all, so the main image scale bars, so those down here, this is going to be 100 microns, okay. and this is 10 microns. So they range in size from a few microns up to tens of microns, you know, 50 or 70, and um, it do, I think it depends on the chemistry involved, but also you can make them smaller by sonication and vortexing. And, you know, they coalesce and you can break them apart again. So you had the kind of colloidal collapse over time, and that was helped by salt. Mm. Are there conditions that keep them separated for longer? Yeah, so we, um, we're going to be starting to do some of these this work, actually. Um, so I mentioned that we could assemble a lipid layer. That was a phospholipid layer around it, and perhaps assembling this type of layer, monolayer, bilayer, multilayer, we don't know. But perhaps assembling this type of lipid layer around it could prevent um, uh, coalescence and also maybe prevent uh, you know the exchange of things in and out of the droplets. But also, there are things called pickering emulsions, which are basically um, if you have some type of phase separated system, there's these little particles that locate specifically to the outside of the droplets that prevent 
coalescence, one of which is it's an interesting study by Christine Keating's group at Penn State where they used clay particles around aqueous two-phase system droplets to prevent their coalescence. So there are some like chemical or physical ways perhaps that these could maintain their individuality. All right, any other questions for Tony? All right, if not, we'll move on to our last talk of the day. All right, thanks a lot everyone.